Anastasia, Anastasia, are you there? What? Oh, yes, I was, yes. Hi, Kelsey, I was just taking advantage of that break to catch up on a few uh, Zs. So, uh, hello, hi, my name is Anastasia Walma, PA with the Rocky Mountain MS Center. It's a great pleasure to be with you all here today for the Education Summit. Uh, I would like to present to you um, some, some information about sleep and your health, and I hope that you will um, enjoy. So sleep and dreaming have always aroused our curiosity and theories as to the cause and function have been described since the beginning of recorded history. Uh, this fascination is widely evidenced in the work of artists, philosophers, poets, yogis, clerics, and priests. Uh, sleep and dreaming have also been an important topic of inquiry throughout history of religion and history of philosophy. Accounts of specific dreams of Jacob and Joseph were recorded in the um, Bible in the chapter Genesis. These dreams were divine manifestations and even ancient Indian philosophical traditions of yoga and Vitana thought that consciousness uh, continued in deep sleep, even when ordinary mental activity quieted down or stopped. And theories were proposed as early as Greek philosophers such as Aristotle in regards to the nature of sleep and the purpose of sleep. Um, fast forward in time in the 19th century, the interpretation of dream content and its relationship with human emotions became the focus of psychoanalytic theory in the early decades of, of, of the um, 1900s. Uh, and it was regarded as a meaningful reflection of unconscious mental functioning. Um, and as we can see, sleep is a cherished time. I actually, this is my daughter and I, uh, and I, I got a picture of her in the morning coming in to wake her up and she had been like that all night long. Um, so sleep is just a wonderful thing. Um, so then as time went by, um, out of the fields of psychiatry and um, psychology, dream research started to play a central role um, in the 1950s. Uh, beginning in the 1970s, sleep research shifted from psychology uh, towards studying more about the biology of sleep and studying sleep disorders as well. This is a picture of a polysomnography um, of a patient who is hooked up at night. They're monitoring his brain activity and his breathing, as well as if they're snoring. Um, there are monitors looking at oximetry, as well as leg movements at night. So the development of sleep laboratory techniques ushered in a new era of, of sleep and dream study. Um, this included the discovery of REM sleep and the various different stages of sleep. Um, and then after a half century as the dominant paradigm of sleep analysts, psychology was largely eclipsed by neurobiology as dreaming became closely identified with the physiological events of REM sleep as well as non-REM um, sleep. So I developed an interest in sleep uh, while working nights, um, working my way through college. Uh, and here I am um, probably at 2 a.m. on June 17th, 1993 um, in a sleep lab in Seattle, Washington. Um, and this is where I developed my interest in sleep. And it was only in the 1990s did the sleep studies experience a resurgence through advances in neuroscience and the development of neuroimaging techniques that allowed us to characterize cerebral function through the sleep-wake cycle. Um, but the definitive functions of sleep continued to elude us and the subjects of considerable debate. This one is regarding um, the structures of sleep, including slow wave um, and um, uh, sleep spindles. And so it'll come up a little bit later in the talk in regards to how these things, um, um, how we think that they correlate to synaptic remodeling um, during sleep. Uh, but I just wanted to give you an example here of the, uh, of the type of wave. So, so back on this machine here that you can see here behind me, these are the old, old <laughs> uh, machines. Um, then we would have these 
sleep waves um, that we could monitor and study uh, where when your eyes were awake, um, we could see certain types of waves, then they were closed, we could see a different kind of waves. Um, and then in stage two, we'd start to see these sleep spindles. Um, stage four, we'd see these delta waves. Um, and then REM sleep, you'd see something kind of looking like awake. However, you would have the eyes, the eye movements um, associated with those as well. Um, so on to the PET, the PET scan. Um, here's an example of a human brain when it's awake on the top. Um, the color coding depicts active cerebral brain areas, um, going from red to blue, uh, blue areas being the more inactive states. When the brain is alert with high brainwave activity, the awake brain shows activity that resembles the phase of REM. Um, sleep when the brain is dreaming. So the PET scan shows the metabolic activity of the brain. And a radioactive tracer, uh, here it's radio labeled glucose, is injected into the bloodstream and absorbed by these active tissues of the brain. Um, and you can see that in normal sleep, there's still a lot of activity going on. And in REM sleep, it's very active. Um, uh, the brain is very active. Um, and so we really should not think about sleep as some sort of dormant state for our body, even though um, our understanding of consciousness, which was the fascination of the early philosophers and, um, and uh, uh, artists. Uh, but in fact, there's a lot going on in sleep. And that's um, and my fascination with sleep uh, really want, uh, brought me to want to, uh, uh, to give this talk to you today. So uh, before we begin, how, so I just want to make sure to establish some things. Um, so I'm going to present some ideas, uh, new ideas in the field of neurobiology and neuroscience. And I think that these are important for my patients and persons interested in demyelinating disease to, to know about and understand because these are advances in neuroscience and I think that they are really interesting and cutting edge. Uh, but it is important for you to understand um, that we don't know what, how exactly sleep interfaces with multiple sclerosis. Um, and, and when I'm presenting these data that are going to follow, I, I do want you to know that in the small studies that have been done, looking at the ways in which sleep affects persons with MS is that multiple sclerosis on PET scans on, on, in, in a research setting has not um, been associated with an elevated uh, abnormal proteins or um, normal or, or tau uh, burden on PET scans. Um, however, it does seem to affect more about the way persons function. So, um, so persons with sleep disorders, which is the type of things that can be evaluated and detected on polysomnography, um, do have an impact on the functioning of persons with MS. So for example, if there are sleep related disorders like insomnia or um, very commonly in MS, uh, uh, breathing disorders such as sleep apnea, um, either obstructive or central sleep apnea, uh, as well as restless legs and periodic limb movements and sleep can disrupt the sleep. And when, these, uh, when sleep is disrupted, we do have evidence, strong evidence that it can be associated with diminished visual memory, verbal memory, executive function, which is a very common complaint in persons with MS. Um, fatigue uh, also can be associated with this. However, fatigue is also an independent um, factor that occurs in multiple sclerosis, one in which we don't entirely understand. Um, but I think it's important to understand that even with the good night's sleep, uh, persons with MS can still very much be fatigued and then have fatigue all day and still very much not be able to fall asleep at night. Okay, so understanding that, I wanna shift over um, to talk about uh, the lymphatic system. Um, so, and then we're gonna talk about the interaction of the nervous system and the lymphatic system. Um, and the lymphatic system plays a major role in the body's immune system and is the primary site relating to adaptive immune systems such as T cells and B cells. Um, it's also a part of the circulatory system and the immune system made up of large networks of lymph, lymphatic vessels, lymph nodes, organs, and tissues. 
Um, and it has multiple interrelated functions, such as the removal of um, interstitial fluid that's just in between tissue fluid from the tissues, absorbing and transporting fatty acids and fats from the digestive system, um, transporting white blood cells to and from the lymph nodes, uh, you know, seen here on the diagram in, uh, in more of the round segments of the green and into the bones, as well as transporting antigen presenting cells such as dendritic cells to lymph nodes where immune response is stimulated. And we know in MS, or we think we know, um, that the inflammation starts in the blood and then travels to the brain um, in regards to multiple sclerosis and, 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 and um, inflammation. Um, so uh, here's a picture of the glymphatic system. So previously, the central nervous system was thought to be devoid of lymphatics. Um, there was an immune privileged organ, there was a blood brain barrier, and so there was only specific egress and, um, of, of immune cells across this blood brain barrier and ability to get into the brain. However, in 2012, the glymphatic or the glial lymphatic pathway uh, was identified in the ro rodent brain first and then later in humans. In this slide, you can see the fluid pathway here um, contained in the subarachnoid space. Um, and it keeps uh, the, it's produced in the choroid plexus, which is found, you can't really see it on this diagram, um, but it flows through the ventricular system, which you can see in blue. Um, and then, it uh, and then goes to the subarachnoid space of the brain and spinal cord. And then cerebral spinal fluid contained in the subarachnoid space um, keeps the central nervous system buoyant and serves as a fluid source for the uh, glymphatic influx. Um, and then, like we said, the 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 egress of the cranial cerebral spinal fluid, the orange arrows, fall into three functionally distinct category. Um, uh, so primarily around the cranial nerves and spinal nerves and dural lymphatic vessels and arachnoid granulations. So, um, now the contribution and importance of each of these egress pathways are still a matter of debate. Um, but the main um, egress site in both rodents and humans is along the olfactory nerve uh, uh, through the cribriform plate, which is found on number one there. Um, so from here, the cerebral spinal fluid is drained towards the cervical lymph nodes um, and back into the um, circulatory system. So the discovery of an authentic brain lymphatic system known as the glymphatic system proved the existence of perivascular channels penetrating arteries and veins um, in, the, in the nervous system. Um, and it cleans the interstitial space in the central nervous system. Um, now, further research started to elucidate how this system might play a role in central nervous system disease. This is my cat. Um, she likes to crawl in Zoom, which is my tortoise, my Russian tortoise's uh, terrarium and spend time with him under the heat lamp. Um, so this talk was inspired by in a neurology grand rounds in winter 2020 um, on a growing number of studies suggesting that poor sleep might actually be a driver for Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. And I, I recognize that this summit is for persons with MS and related disorders, but I think you'll agree that this early work is relevant to this audience. Um, and the research that's demonstrating underlying mechanisms that had not been fully understood and is making advances um, in, in, our, in, in the neurology community um, of the value and purpose of sleep. So, you know, in the past, I think that people were wondering, and I think we still do, we didn't, we, we'd say, we don't really know why we sleep, but I think we are starting to understand why we sleep and how it, how, what is the brain doing? And it is not in a dormant state. It's actually in a very active state, um, as you can see on the PET scans. Um, uh, but more research will need to be done on neuroinflammatory disease. Uh, Dr. Bryce McConnell uh, is the director of the sleep research program at CU's uh, Alzheimer's and Cognition Center. And he was kind enough to share some of his slides that he presented at Grand Rounds uh, with me to be able to present to you today. All right, so why do we sleep? 
Um, let's back up for a minute and see how, the, how sleep interfaces with neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's. Um, there are three main areas what we are going to cover today. Um, to the left is the so-called glymphatic system. Uh, this has been the leading area of interest in thinking about uh, how uh, the brain might be protecting itself from neurodegenerative uh, diseases in sleep. Um, and then the brain flush, we would say, is active when we are awake, but it's even more active when we're asleep and it clears metabolic waste from our brain. At the top panel, we'll be talking about how sleep uh, is responsible for this synaptic remodeling and regulation of neuronal excitability. And I know that that's highly technical, but just understand that uh, neurons interact with each other and across a synapse. And then, and then just like bones or skin or anything, that that has to be remodeled and maintained over time. Um, so your body is constantly rebuilding and remodeling itself. These are also playing a role in the way that we consolidate memories, the way in which we um, uh, everything is kind of connected. Um, and so then this is where I think this, this, this synaptic remodeling is important for cognitive functions. I mean, they all are, uh, but I think this one in particular. Um, and then also uh, would be an, an interest to our group is the relationship between sleep and immune biology. Um, and we can see down there that chronic sleep deprivation does have an impact directly on the structures of the brain. Uh, oligodendrocytes and astrocytes are supportive cells within the, the nervous system in regards to um, the neurons. And, and we can see in healthy folks, which you'll see a little later in the slides, how uh, sleep deprivation, even one night, um, can change the structures um, to uh, start to cause a neuroinflammatory response by increasing um, uh, tumor necrosis factor, as well as IL-6, which these are pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, causing um, changes um, that would be uh, outside of homeostasis. And so it starts to turn things towards the negative. Um, so as we start thinking about this brain flush system, the glymphatic system, uh, the concept is when, when we sleep, the brain tissue is being flushed by an increase of cerebral spinal fluid flow. Um, and then on this, um, this, this diagram on the right, this little cartoon, you see A, which is the red right there. Um, and then next to the red is these, so the arterial flow basically. Um, and then the, what we're seeing on the arterial side to the venous side, which is in blue, is there's a flow gradient pot uh, that's potentially sweeping metabolic waste and destructive proteins associated with neurodegenerative uh, diseases. The hypothesis is, is just the simple process of aging. Um, the system is becoming less efficient. And in Alzheimer's disease, we're getting a buildup of these bad proteins, which are normal. I mean, it, it's normal to have these proteins, um, but in Alzheimer's disease, they turn into plaques and tangles that are being deposited and becoming problems. Now we don't see those in multiple sclerosis like we talked about earlier. Um, however, I think it is important to understand that even in healthy controls, we do see that these toxins can build up with chronic sleep deprivation. Um, so here and across the diagram here, uh, we see that the metabolic waste, uh, so, so the little yellow flecks like sprinkles, those would be the beta amyloid proteins. Um, and then the metabolic waste are the, the kind of hot pink uh, little sprinkles. Um, the neuron is in green. And then the astrocytes, which are the supportive cells, are in purple. Um, uh, the little blue dots are the aquaporin-4 transfer um, areas in which uh, the transport is coming in and out through the, uh, through the barrier to the vessels. And we see that in the young, things are flowing, uh, things are going well, it's going through the venous system and it's dumping out, it's getting out. However, uh, as we age, we start to have a little bit more of a deposition of these um, proteins, uh, beta amyloid in specific, into the um, uh, parenchyma or the tissue of the brain. And then Alzheimer's disease, there's a breakdown of the aquaporin-4 transport, and we actually see a, 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 
large influx of these beta amyloid, they have to go somewhere. So they are simply deposited into the tissue, which then creates these plaques and tangles um, that are uh, important for that disease process. Okay, so we had talked about how slow wave sleep remodels our synapses. So slow waves, so, so different types of, so that's why I showed you that model of the different uh, waves that can occur um, on an EEG during sleep that we can actually assess and um, see represented on these studies. Um, and so then with these deep, uh, the, the, the larger delta waves, um, that occur in stages three and four, uh, we think that that is the time when the synaptic plasticity uh, are being remodeled um, in a way in which strengthens your learning, your processing, uh, your relationships. And so it's just forming more of these connections, the neural connections that, that form our understanding and our consciousness uh, within the world. Um, and really those happen during sleep, and which is why in the old, you know, kind of old, uh, they would always say, try to, try to get a lot of sleep before a test. Don't stay up all night studying that you'll perform better if you actually get some sleep. Um, and the reason why that is, is because uh, you actually consolidate and will be able to retrieve those memories a little bit better. Um, so, um, so during the, the sleep, I just wanted to show you here again, another example of the sleep spindle and then the slow wave sleep, uh, slow wave, which is the A and then these spindles. Um, and so we think that these are mechanisms of memory consolidation during sleep. Um, and then we can see here that these spindles are actually, we can directly correlate those and have been done through studies looking at the ways in which uh, those studies electrically. So we're just seeing, uh, we're just seeing the evidence of ink on a paper across time, uh, but that actually correlates to a very specific biological process that's going on um, within the tissues, uh, deep tissues within the brain, um, looking at synaptic plasticity. And plasticity, as you know, is something that we look at for healing and remodeling. Um, so then the important work that's being done in the memory and Alzheimer's literature is in regarding, um, you know, whether or not these, uh, dis, uh, the immunodysregulation, does it drive Alzheimer's pathology? And the answer appears to be yes. Uh, so uh, systemic and inflammatory changes are hypothesized to prime these uh, supportive cells and immune cells that can drive this destructive process that we kind of looked at a little bit earlier. Um, so chronic sleep deprivation is actually associated with an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, it does not, again, I just wanna say, it is not causing the cognitive changes that we're seeing in persons with MS, um, but I think that even in folks that have, uh, uh, so th there's evidence that I'm gonna sh show you to you a little later is in, in healthy controls, um, we do see that there are these abnormal proteins and an increase in this dysregulation and neuronal functioning that occurs in even people who have, um, you know, no health conditions, no neurological conditions with just one night of sleep deprivation. Um, and we think the way that this is happening is this, um, um, this amyloid peptide uh, is activating the microglia uh, within the nervous system that then uh, activates the astrocytes, which is that supportive cell through neuroinflammation and pro-inflammatory chemicals um, that then affects the neurons and causes them to have uh, loss of nutrition, also uh, chemical dysregulation, and then can lead to an Alzheimer's neuronal death, and then eventually progression of disease and um, um, an onset in itself. Um, and so a lot of the targets in, in Alzheimer's disease is looking to see if they can modify these sort of things. But I think it's really interesting to see that inflammation could be a driver in something that we thought was just neurodegeneration. Um, so does this mean that disrupting sleep increases neurodegenerative disease related proteins? Um, and the answer is yes. So here on the left, we do see uh, that this is the healthy, healthy controls. These are folks that were, uh, you know, college age, no issues at all. And we did see that there was this beta amyloid accumulation in the brain after one night of sleep deprivation. 
Um, the thought is that, and then you can see over here on the graph, uh, is that it's very clearly, uh, it's differentiated and, there, and from the control to the sleep deprived, we definitely see an increase in the interstitial fluid of the tau in mice and the CSF tau in humans. Um, and so we were able to see definitely that this was a correlation to sleep deprivation alone. There wasn't other reasons that were causing this. And so we can already see that then uh, depriving a human and a mouse, sadly, uh, of sleep for even one night can start to disturb these processes. Um, and I think that that's, uh, as, a, as a mom, I was thinking, is this the reason why, uh, is there mom brain? Is this the reason why, you know, uh, when you're not really functioning the next day, when you're uh, sleep deprived, even without neurological disease, uh, that that could be the reason why we um, function less well is because this buildup of toxins, which again, just supports the meaningfulness and importance of sleep. Um, so does that mean that disrupting sleep can cause neurodegeneration? Um, and so at least uh, we have seen in mice um, that there is, uh, again, these are uh, slides of the um, of brain in mice. And we do see that there are these depositions and, and it's specifically caused by chronic um, sleep deprivation. Um, compared to control. Um, and then we do see that there are other deposits on the right-hand side um, when compared to controls who aren't sleep deprived. Um, so, uh, so in summary, sleep interfacing with Alzheimer's disease is likely a problem with the glymphatic flow, um, a immuno kind of dysregulation, um, and then a synaptic dysfunction. It's probably a threefold problem uh, that are all interrelated, um, that sleep is associated, um, interestingly, with Alzheimer's disease, chronic sleep um, deprivation. Um, and so uh, it could, but obviously everybody who's sleep deprived doesn't end up going on to have Alzheimer's disease. So it's not a single factor um, implication, um, but it is early research looking at the ways in which sleep could cause pathogenesis and then potentially how it could be ameliorated um, if we can, uh, try to have persons sleep well uh, to slow the progression of um, Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so you may be wondering, how much sleep do I need? <laughs> I know I was. Uh, so I think that these, this is the recommendation of um, the National Sleep Foundation according to age. So it's going to change over time. As we know, teenagers and toddlers, they sleep a lot and they should. Uh, my cat probably sleeps, uh, here, I'll just show you my cat right here, sleeping away. Yeah. Um, uh, probably, I don't know. Does she sleep 18 hours? It seems like it. Um, and, and so I just think the issue is that uh, obviously biologically we are meant to sleep and it shouldn't be, sh there shouldn't, we shouldn't shortcut that. Uh, lifestyle now is all about uh, coffee, go, 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 be on your phones, blue light, um, trying to maximize daytime performance, getting up early, staying up late. Uh, and I just think that when, when we take a pause and just focus on life and living life, that if, if we're focusing on health and dietary changes and all the things that we need to do for that, we should not neglect sleep. Uh, it is not a dormant state where nothing is happening. Um, it is an important part of your health um, and one in which I, I hope that I have convinced you um, to, to value. So I think that in addition to the other things, um, and then also I would just understand that, you know, persons with multiple sclerosis have a number of reasons not to sleep, which can include, um, you know, bladder dysfunction at night, spasticity, pain, insomnia, like we talked about before. Um, and, and, and just to remind you that these are things that can be addressed by your physician or a PA or nurse practitioner and should be brought up in those visits so that we can, we can talk about those things and see what kinds of solutions can be had because, you know, suffering in silence is, is, is not the way to go. So, um, yes, and this is me napping with my beautiful kitten, Cookie. 
Uh, and, um, and so I hope that you have enjoyed this talk. I sure enjoyed preparing it for you. Um, I'm really interested to hear your comments. And so I hope that you have a great rest of your day.